land on which our webinar presenters and participants are located. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past and present. My name's Nicole Sather and I'm a clinical psychologist. I currently work at Phoenix Australia, the Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health. Uh, I also have a military background. I spent 23 years in the Australian Army as a Army psychologist. And during that time, I was the commanding officer of the first psychology unit. So I was responsible for providing services to people who were deployed overseas. And I spent several years as a senior army psychologist. Um, I also serve now as a reservist, as a colonel. And I also have very much a, a family connection to the military. My father was a Vietnam veteran and I have a son who's serving in the military at the moment. Um, I'd also now like to introduce our other panel members that we have with us. And this truly is a national and international group that we have online. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Christy Heffernan, who's a clinical psychologist, and she's joining us today from Sydney. Hi, Christy. Hello. Christy just recently joined us uh, at Phoenix Australia, and she set up our satellite as our, as our first person working in Sydney. So she's getting used to working by herself in an office. But you're getting used to that now, aren't you? All the joys, yes, absolutely. Yeah, great. <laughs> can do Thanks. a webinar and not disturb anybody else in the office. It's fantastic. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and this is Christy's first webinar, so welcome. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Phil Parker. He's a general practitioner who's joining us from Brisbane. Hi, Phil. Hello. And Hi. hopefully it's a bit warmer than uh, in Brisbane than it is here in Adelaide this evening. A little bit chilly, but uh, I'm sure it's not as bad no, as no, me. No, probably your sense of, uh, or you're deciding how chilly it is. And okay. finally, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, John Lane, who is joining us this evening from the US. Hi, John. What are you doing over in the US? Uh, I came over for the American Psychiatric Association conference and then um, catching up. Um, at the moment, I'm staying in LA with a, a buddy of mine who I deployed with a few years ago but just catching up with some of the other groups here. Um, San Diego, the Naval Medical Center there in Balboa, and Camp Pendleton, Marines and that sort of stuff too. So catching up with colleagues of mine to see what's going on over here. Mm. Fantastic. And it is one o'clock in the morning uh, in uh, the US. So it, thank you, a special thank you yeah. for uh, agreeing to join us today. Okay. No, well it's actually really appropriate because it was Memorial Day here. So, oh, yes, it was. Um, what better day to be, yeah, and so, you know, what a better day to be doing something like this mm. on, you know, a day which the US celebrates their fallen soldiers. And yeah, battles. absolutely, a perfect day. Great, thanks for joining mm. us. Thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Okay, so in terms of um, the context for this particular panel, uh, of course, like any other interaction that we do, we just want to make sure that uh, we're respectful of each other and uh, any interactions that you make that we do it in the same way that we would for a face-to-face -face activity. And we certainly encourage everyone to participate. There's an opportunity that you can join us through the chat box. Um, and uh, just ask that you remember to keep your questions that you have on the top of this evening's uh, webinar. Um, and please also note if you have any technical issues that you click on through the technical support tab uh, and you can also call Red Back Help Desk if you're having any particular problems. If there is a big problem which is uh, impacting everyone, we will certainly be telling you and announcing that uh, via a uh, general announcement. Um, this is part of a, uh, a whole stream of uh, webinars that we are presenting. This is part of the inaugural MHBN online conference um, and this particular Dream is around mental health in the military and there's two others which are running, grief and loss and also trauma and the impact of adverse childhood experiences. Um, the format for this evening is that we're going to keep it fairly relaxed, there's going to be a bit of a presentation to start off with and then we're just going to have a, uh, a general discussion around um, uh, our own experiences of being uh, in the military and also what it's like uh, to be a practitioner, mental health practitioner. Um, we certainly know that many of the people who are joining us um, have never worked with uh, veterans before uh, and it's great that people are interested in joining us and starting to learn a little bit more about what it's like to be in the military and what you might see when uh, you are working with veterans. Um, and certainly what we're hoping is that by the end of this uh, webinar, what you will have gained from it 
is some uh, improved understanding of uh, why the military culture uh, may influence influence veterans' mental health and the way that they may present when they come to see mental health practitioners. Um, improve your understanding of the presentations that they might have, the somatic and also the mental health presentations of veterans. And finally, to increase your confidence in engaging with veterans. Um, how do you have conversations with them and how do you start to get to the meaning behind their story as well? Okay, so to start off, what we're going to do is to learn a little bit more about our panel members. Um, in particular, what, what it is that we would like to know about them is um, what their experiences have been within the military. So what I'm going to do is ask each of the panellists in turn to tell us a little bit more about themselves, to talk about their experiences in the military, the types of jobs that they had, um, the roles and, and what being in the military meant to them, and then also to talk about what it's like to be a clinician who provides services to veterans. Uh, and to start off, I'm going to ask Phil if you'd like to kick us off. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Phil Parker. I'm a general practitioner in Brisbane. I'm an ex-serving uh, soldier and officer in the Army, and I served from uh, 1988 up until 2017. Uh, during that time, I was a, a soldier in Signals Corps, um, an officer in infantry, and the last seven years of my service was spent as a doctor in medical corps. Uh, in 2012, I deployed to Afghanistan as a senior medical officer uh, within Uruzgan. So, um, my, probably, in fact, it's probably more than half of my life I've spent in the military. So, I can understand how difficult it can be to transition from military to civilian life. We all know that the career in the Defence Force has got a lot of challenges with it. It's, it's an environment which nurtures teamwork and leadership and instills a sense of belonging. And but all of those who have worn the uniform have had to endure difficult work conditions. And for some, they've had to put themselves in harm's way to do what was expected of them. And the outcomes in, this, in these cases has not always been ideal, with some servicemen and women sustaining serious injuries or illnesses in the performance of their jobs. This can be difficult for them to accept, especially when they can no longer do that job. Um, they often become disjointed and lose their sense of belonging. Um, you know, some of these some of these uh, these uh, individuals become medically discharged from the service. They feel discarded, and they develop a great sense of loss. As a fellow veteran, I understand the experience that many of these veterans have gone through. And as a general practitioner, I feel that I'm now well positioned to be able to provide them with some 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 good care. And my goal in their care is to improve their social and vocational functioning. Um, and, and I see the best way to do that is through the development of a, social, a support network with everyone involved invested in the care of the, the individual. I want these, I want these veterans to be surrounded by people who know how to bring out the best in them. And the ultimate outcome uh, will be individuals who uphold a high sense of self-worth and motivation, and I want them to live a fulfilling life. Thanks. Nicole. Great. Thanks, Phil. And thanks for sharing your experiences uh, both in the military and also um, importantly, how you can work successfully with veterans. Uh, we might move on to Sydney now and to Christy. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, Nicole, and hello, everyone. I'm Christy Heffernan, and I have served as a military psychologist since 2005. So across those past 15 years, I've served full-time in the Australian Regular Army, and I continue to serve in the Army Reserve now as a Lieutenant Colonel Psychologist, which means it's now my part-time job. Uh, from 2013 to 16, I also worked as a civilian clinical psychologist on a military base. I joined the military as a psychologist to deploy overseas, like many military um, personnel. Um, I wanted to do clinical psychology work in unpredictable and interesting environments and to provide first response and early interventions. I continue to serve so I can contribute that knowledge and experience and um, I also continue to serve out of the respect and dedication that, and the personal sacrifices that ADF personnel make and that motivates me to continue want to be connected with them. I, whilst working in the regular army, I was um, posted to Townsville and Sydney and I provided mental health awareness and promotions training, resilience based training and clinical interventions and support for ADF personnel. We worked in multidisciplinary teams, so I always had access to people like Phil and John. Um, and now in the community, I don't find I have the same ready access to other health providers, or at least not in the same way. 
In that way, it's my opinion that currently serving military personnel seem to have greater access to the benefits of multidisciplinary care in that primary care setting at least. Again, that's just my opinion. I deployed on several occasions to Afghanistan, Iraq, East Timor and the Solomon Islands. My last deployment to Afghanistan was in February 2012, so I just missed Phil. Um, I provided mental health screening for troops before they returned to Australia and I also led the psychology team in the Middle East area of operations that was tasked to provide the range of psychological support to troops during their deployment from screening, counselling and assessments to critical incident mental health support. I've seen how large numbers of ADF personnel cope well with the stresses of deployment and the general demands of service life including moving regularly around Australia on postings spending long periods of time away from loved ones and family-based supports whilst on military courses and deployments. I've also seen though that sometimes it takes a while for mental health effects of service life to catch up and mostly it's the other people in the veteran's life who tend to see the changes first and encourage them into treatment. I now see that the community clients um, will often have booked their appointment with a psychologist because they identified the need or at least their GP has suggested it but for veterans families are often the ones who have to provide that gentle nudge and in the community the veteran who hasn't established a good relationship with their GP often find it difficult to navigate the system whether it be the Medicare or the DVA Department of Veterans Affairs system. Being able to deploy with ADF personnel overseas to places like Afghanistan and Iraq allowed me to see how units, teams and individuals in the military work. ADF personnel are highly motivated to deploy and it's often referred to as the highlight of one's career. Military personnel are motivated to explore new environments and to test themselves in challenging situations and they go through rigorous military training. So on deployment as a psychologist I was often seeing resilient people but even the resilient people have their limits. What's interesting to remember about overseas deployed environments is that it's not just the risk of being injured or killed that we as treating clinicians needed to be mindful of. The environments themselves can be really harsh. The climate has extreme hot and extreme cold weather. Uh, the physical challenge of carrying body armour, heavy gear and being able to remain fit and healthy whilst literally working 24-7. When you're deployed, you're there to work every day and you need to be flexible and responsive to the changing dynamics on deployment. In my experience I've watched ADF personnel respond to these dynamics extremely well and by referring to ADF I mean Australian Defence Force personnel, sorry for the acronym, um, but I have seen them um, uh, respond very well to those changing dynamics and maintain their physical and mental health. It's not, what's important though is it's not just the deployment itself or the multiple times that someone has deployed that matters, it seems to be what the individual experiences that matters the most. As a clinician in the community I think it's really important to understand that veterans may minimise the impact of what they have been exposed to during service both on deployment and in Australia. If the veteran for example never left a forward operating base on deployment they may deny ever having been in danger despite the risks of hostile forces launching often inaccurate but nevertheless deadly rockets at that base. When considering the mental health impacts of military service, lateral thinking is required rather than the tendency to focus on just exposure to traumatic stresses. Trauma exposure does remain really important but it isn't the only stressor. Not fitting in with the unit, missing family and the feeling of coming home and being isolated from military mates or experiencing the loss of a meaningful job helping overseas communities rebuild can often have detrimental impacts on mood and lead to maladaptive coping. Military experiences need to be understood within the context of the whole range of the roles and environmental challenges and be considered in the context of the strong sense of military identity and motivation to serve that Phil already talked about. During my time in the military I also served as the unit or in-house psychologist at a Sydney based special forces unit in the regular army and then took up a position as a civilian clinical psychologist in that same unit leading a team of in-house psychologists providing clinical interventions on the base. Providing interventions within the unit was a rewarding experience. At times personnel were concerned about the impact that health seeking would, health seeking would have on their career. However, I also noticed the challenge associated with a resilient, capable, experienced veteran acknowledging to themselves they need help. Sometimes it's that self-stigma and not the organisational stigma that is difficult for military personnel to seek help, but most of the time um, it's actually both the self-stigma and the organisational stigma. I draw on the strengths and resilience of veterans when providing clinical treatments, acknowledging their changing view of themselves is no longer capable. 
but rebuilding that, addressing the presenting issue and concurrently drawing on the once very capable, adaptable part of themselves that got them through the rigours of training and operational experiences in the first place. As Nicole mentioned, I currently now work for Phoenix Australia, the Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health as a Senior Clinical Specialist here in Sydney, where I provide advice and training to organisations, communities and individuals impacted by traumatic stress and to practitioners and ex-service organisations who support veterans in the community via the Centenary of Anzac Practitioner Support Service. I also continue to work as a clinical psychologist in private practice and provide trauma-focused treatment to veterans and work with other emergency services and individuals impacted by trauma, anxiety and depression. I continue to work, enjoy working with veterans, acknowledge that providing support in the community to this group has its challenges including not having them access to the multidisciplinary team in the same way as I mentioned previously. I understand some of the challenge, but I also continue to learn about what challenges veterans face after service. And um, understand also that sometimes we can treat military populations as a homogeneous group, but we all, all always need to consider an individually tailored approach for veterans. Understanding the context in which veterans have come from does help me in my ongoing support of them in the community, but also in my ongoing support to serving um, current serving personnel and their families in my armour reserve role. And that is probably enough from me. Great. Thanks, Thanks Nicole. Thanks, Christina. Covered a lot of ground and we will uh, we'll catch up on some of those topics a bit later in our discussion. Uh, finally, over to you, John. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. So I'm a bit like Phil. I had joined the Army at the white old age of 17. That was the Army Reserve in 1989. And, um, then had nearly 10 years as a soldier. And while I was doing that, I ended up doing an arts degree, English lit and psychology part-time, and then decided to work, oh, sorry, not decided, I decided to do medicine because I was uh, administration sergeant for the director of medical services in Victoria. And um, this was in the late 90s. And so I ended up um, <laughs> not getting in the first year round because I didn't have year 12 biology. So I moved to Hobart, did my year 12 biology at the local college. and did my honours year in psychology and then um, was a sponsored medical undergraduate student and then worked for the Army for a number of years as a general duties medical officer before starting my psychiatry training in 2010. So back to the reserves then. In 2013, I deployed to Kandahar in, um, in Afghanistan. That's the, the role three multinational medical unit. And so I was working as a psychiatrist with the mental health team there, looking after most of the US forces, but other NATO countries as well too. And um, that was probably um, one of the, the biggest experiences of my life, I think, you know, spending six months working in that environment in and seeing the range of different people from different countries and the way you know, their defence forces work you know, and the attitudes, mentalities, and those sorts of things too. So um, I finished my fellowship in 2014 and went straight into a, went straight, I started doing a small amount of private practice whilst working as a forensic psychiatrist and then switched over to full-time private practice, basically so I could see uh, military veterans, police and, and first responders. And they make up the majority of my, the vast majority of my private practice now. This has actually decreased a bit though because I'm currently doing a uh, PhD through Adelaide University, the Centre for Traumatic Stress Studies, and I'm actually evaluating a skills-based intervention for emotional and interpersonal regulation there and um, trying to develop a cohort of peer counsellors to deliver these sorts of interventions too. I think a lot of clinicians can become, you know, pretty intimidated by veterans and, you know, it's it's fantastic hearing Phil and Christy and you Nicole talking about your experiences and stuff and you know here's the four of us with probably an average 25 years of military service behind us but to people in the audience that don't have that sort of background or whatever else it can be really hard treating veterans because mm. you know, they can be grumpy they can be irritable they can <laughs> not necessarily know a lot about themselves and they can be really hard to connect with and I think what I'd like to, to reiterate to clinicians, when you're dealing with veterans, you have to remember that you know being in the military, whether that's Army, Navy, Air Force, is fairly institutionalising, and it's a fairly life-defining trajectory to a large degree too. Because you know when you join the military, you get conditioned in a number of different ways, 
And as a result, you tend to lose a lot of personal identity and then that actually gets invested in your role. And so who you are becomes much more about what you do rather than who you are as a person. Because who you are as a person is uh, in some ways irrelevant. Because what we're interested in in, in the defence force is can you do the job or not? And you know this can lead to problems down the track because when people can't do their jobs, they get lost. Because who are they now that they don't actually have this role or this purpose in their life? And this comes about, in my opinion, because military people are conditioned and trained to be very task oriented. And that means that we do all sorts of you know, stupid things or what seem like stupid things and put up with a hell of a lot because the job demands it of us. And because the job demands it of us, what we have to do is be able to get that distress, anger, all the other sorts of things and put it in a box and put it away so that we can keep on going and keep on doing our jobs. Unfortunately, this leads to problems down the track and particularly with sort of understanding of emotions or understanding and um, acknowledging what's actually going on with us. And so, you know, particularly when you lose that sense of task and mission and purpose, life doesn't have a lot of meaning. And so, you know, what I have seen basically is that veterans can feel that they're broken and rock up to the doorstep of a clinician and go, I'm screwed, <laughs> what am I going to do? And, you know, the poor clinician is there going, oh, where do we start? <laughs> yeah. And this can be a really challenging job. And you know, like Phil talked about in terms of having some sort of social connection, I think this is really fundamental. And I was the coach for the archery team for the Indigenous Games last year. And you know, I wasn't there as a psychiatrist, I was there as the archery coach. And you know, this is really important to sort of recognise because Defence Force people, as Christy said, are really resilient. You know, they will try their damnedest and they'll do the best they can. And using sport as a means of adapting to what's going on and overcoming mental stress and distress is another way to leverage that whole task, mission, purpose thing to re-establish a different identity. And it's really important to remember that, you know, in the Defence Force, we work in groups, we work in teams, no one's by themselves. But when you leave the Defence Force, you're there all by yourself, you know. And your poor family and often, oftentimes is stuck with the result of that as well too. So leveraging those social supports, leveraging some sort of um, task and a new purpose to find meaning in life and therefore a new identity is what I think is one of the more important things for clinicians to consider when they're seeing people in front of them. The final point I'd just like to say is um, if you do feel intimidated and you feel that you can't understand, don't be afraid to say that because it can be a really easy icebreaker to say to someone, look, you know, I can't imagine what it, what it would have been like to do those sorts of things, but I can imagine it would have been really hard. So if you think I don't understand something, feel free to tell me about it. So just be open and honest and respectful, and I think you'll find you'll get a pretty good result. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone, for uh, sharing those insights. Lots of great points and ones we will discuss in a bit more detail. Uh, and I think that the uh, presentation shows the wealth of experience that people can have, uh, both from their own military service, but also I think it really nicely illustrates that sometimes you don't know who a veteran is. Um, I think if you saw any of us on the streets, you wouldn't immediately go, they must be a veteran and uh, all of us have significant military uh, experience. So I think that's a really good thing for people to keep in mind when you're working with people in the community. Remember to ask whether or not people have had military service. Don't mm. presume that uh, you'll be able to just tell by looking at them. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is I'm just going to give a little bit of an oversight as to what do we mean by a veteran? What is a veteran in an Australian context and what do we know about them? Um, in terms of a definition of a veteran, it really means anyone who spent at least one full day uh, in the full-time military. But uh, just remember that many people, even if they've served for a very long period of time or have been on deployment, won't actually call themselves a veteran. Um, we have over 600,000 living Australian veterans at the moment. Um, about a half of them have been deployed on different types of operations. That could mean conflicts such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, the Second World War. It could mean that they've been on border protection tasks. It could mean that they've been on peacekeeping operations such as uh, Rwanda or the, uh, Somalia or East Timor or the Solomon Islands. Or it could mean that they've been deployed on uh, humanitarian or disaster assistance, both internationally or either within Australia. 
Um, we know that many people don't have any connection at all in terms of services with uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, which means that they'll be out there in the community getting their health and mental health care. Uh, there's over 58,000 people who are serving in the Australian Defence Force at the moment and about 5,000 every year will transition out of full-time military service into the reserves, either active or an active reserve, or they'll discharge completely. What we know about uh, more contemporary veterans, a lot of that comes from a recent piece of uh, research which was done on behalf of the Departments of uh, Defence and Veterans Affairs, the Transition and Wellbeing Research Program, and that was actually run, uh, led by the Centre for Traumatic Stress Studies at the University of Adelaide. Um, and from this group that participated in the research, most discharged at their own request. About 20% were medically discharged and only 3% were non-voluntary administrative discharges. And what we find is most of them are engaged in meaningful or purposeful activity once they leave the military. So in terms of employment or studying um, and about 62% are in civilian employment. The most common reasons for transition are things like impact of service life on their family or looking for better job prospects and a smaller percentage will talk about health or mental health impacts. What we also know from this research is that we start to see a deterioration in terms of uh, general mental health and physical health as people transition out of full-time military service. And in fact, we see some particular risks for mental health. Um, in this cohort, almost three out of four met the criteria for a lifetime mental disorder, almost half met the criteria for a mental disorder in the past year. And those who've been medically discharged were particularly at risk. And remember that they include some people who'd only served for a very small period of time. So for example, um, people who might be very young, who have junior rank and who've never been deployed. Uh, a substantial also number also had subclinical problems. So didn't meet diagnostic criteria, but were presenting with other problems such as anger or drinking too much. Um, having problems socially connecting with other people or problems sleeping. And we know that that can be a precursor for later disorder. Um, we also know that many of those who met the criteria for 12 month mental disorders were not medically discharged, nor were they current members of the Department of Veterans Affairs. So again, that means that they may not be actively in care or they're getting their care from community services. Um, and we also saw an increase in terms of the risk up to you know the following the first year of uh, post transition. So that first 12 months, things went okay, but from one year onwards, um, we found that people really were starting to see deterioration in terms of their mental health um, status. We see that help seeking in this group is actually pretty good compared to the general community standard. It's higher than what we see in the community, and it's in line from what we see in other militaries internationally and other veterans populations. But what we do see is that they do need to improve how many people are getting into evidence-based care and how many are staying long enough in that care to be really starting to see some benefits. So that's definitely one area that we, we want to be able to see some improvements in terms of getting people into evidence-based care and keeping them in an evidence-based care. Just in terms of the type of disorders that we see in this group, um, over 50% have no disorder, so it's about 52%. And then the disorders that we see in the biggest uh, percentages, um, around the 17% are post-traumatic stress disorder and also panic attacks. And then the next group, which is about 11%, are depressive episodes. And then there's a whole range of different conditions that we see. So it's really important that you keep in mind if you're seeing a veteran that you're doing a thorough, comprehensive assessment to be looking at all different types of um, psychiatric disorders and also psychosocial considerations for individuals. Finally, we also know that um, we will see that yeah, there is a risk for an increased risk for suicide uh, in veteran populations from some research again commissioned by Defence and Veterans Affairs, which was undertaken by the Australian Institute of uh, Health and Welfare. Um, we see in contemporary veterans, uh, so those people who served um, you know, between 2001 and 2016, um, who had served at least one full day in the ADF, that there had been 373 certified suicide deaths. And what we see is that there is a higher rate of suicides amongst those who are ex-serving men um, compared to the general community. 
Um, but we do see that those people who are still serving, either in the full time or in the reserves, um, that there is a lower suicide uh, rate compared to the general Australian community. Um, and where we see a particular risk factors in ex-serving are those men who are under the age of 30 and they have a suicide risk of over, over two times higher than that of Australian men of the same age. So that's just to give you a little bit of a context of what we see in terms of the mental health presentations of those people who are veterans and they may be people who are serving or ex-serving and, and certainly we know that people who may sometimes access community services um, may still be serving members, um, but particularly we're thinking about today those people who have now transitioned out of full-time military service. So what we'd like to do now in the next part of the presentation is to start to have a bit of a discussion about um, what are some of the things that we should be taking into consideration when we're seeing people uh, starting to present for mental health uh, services uh, who might be concerned about their health or about their mental health and to open up for a bit of a uh, discussion with the rest of the panellists. Um, so first of all, what I'd like to do is to think about um, what is the impact upon military service upon um, the sense of identity and the type of presentations that we see? From the research, there seems to be some protective factors for mental health associated with being in the military. Um, and I was starting, just thought we'd uh, have a bit of discussion amongst the panel members as to why we think that is. Maybe, Phil, if you have any insights, why do you think there are protective factors for military service and what do you think some of those are? I think um, the environment within the military is, is significantly different because they are in close contact with, with peers, with colleagues, with their team and with the, the health providers within the military. And in fact, within the military, um, it's a requirement of their employment to maintain their health. So mm -hmm. they're more likely to be picked up if they're, if they're sort of going a little bit downhill, if they're, if they're suffering or if they're experiencing any symptoms of any condition, whether that's physical or mental. Um, I think also there is an opportunity to provide rehab and support, uh, and that's and that's enacted pretty quickly within the military uh, to try and get these get our service personnel back on their feet and and to ensure we get them uh, fit and well as as quickly as we can. Whereas in the civilian environment, that responsibility is left to the individual, and mm. and quite often for these ex-serving personnel. They don't understand the civilian health system as well as as, as well as uh, the average civilian person out there. They're not sure who to seek help from, or which avenues they need to pursue in, in terms of engaging the right, the, the, the appropriate type of support that they need. Great. So it's not just about uh, the type of experiences they might have in the military, but it's also the wraparound system of support which is readily available to them. Uh, whilst they're in military service, which is not so apparent as they move out of the military. Any other comments from Christy or John about uh, what it is that, that seems to have some sort of protection for people whilst they're in service? I'd actually just like to echo Phil's comments and, you know, be, for people to be cognizant of the fact that it's such a highly regulated and structured environment. So your daily routine from the day, you know, from the time you get up, the time you're at work at seven o'clock in the morning to the time you go home and afterwards as well too, everything is done within that specific environment. And the nature of the job entails frequent postings. So you might be in one location for 12 months and then all of a sudden you're off to some other part of Australia. And so you get used to associating with people who live in the same environment. And mm -hmm. so that fishbowl accompanies you wherever you go around the country and you associate with those people within that highly structured and routine environment. And so when you lose all those social supports, that, as Phil said, when you're now an individual and you're expected to do everything else, that's when it gets difficult. And you know, a simple example is that defence members, full-time defence members, don't have Medicare cards because their um, health is supposed to be um, provided for by defence. Now, some people will go outside that system and, and get a Medicare card and seek private health uh, treatment for their conditions because they don't want it to affect their careers. But for a lot of other people, it's like, oh my God, what do I do? How do I get a Medicare card? What do you mean I have to go and find a GP? How do I do that? How do I actually get reimbursed for this? You know, that's, that can be really quite tricky. And then, you know, um, you know, there's 
the, the issues with DBA as well, and it can be quite difficult navigating that system on top of everything else. And so people get frustrated and they give up. So it can be quite difficult just coming from such a routine and structured environment to going to somewhere where people feel like they have to fend for themselves. Yeah, fantastic. And um, Christy, what do you think? How important do you think the role of mateship or camaraderie is to military members whilst they're serving? I think it's hugely important, Nicole, as I sort of said in my introduction. But I also, um, I also think it's really important in terms of it provides that sort of that it's not just a support mechanism, but a you know camaraderie means you've actually gone through some experiences with other people. So mm -hmm. there's that idea of shared experience as well. We know that social support buffers mental health impacts um, and and stress. So it is really important. So when they're still in service, still serving, then they're actually um, benefiting from that camaraderie. What they're also benefiting, and it's along the same lines, is the supportive nature of leadership and the command that has, mm. that, um, has on serving personnel. So the command structure within the military actually puts front and center that the leader or the commander is actually responsible for the mental health of troops. So that in itself is actually really protective in terms of if you have to go and do something difficult, um, even if you have to move regularly and that's the challenge, if you have to go leave your family for long periods of time and that's the challenge, the person that you're going to do that with is, is looking after you, they've got your back, as well as um, all of your team members as well. So that sense of camaraderie and shared experience is really protective for, for current, serving mental, um, current serving veterans. Great, thanks Christy. And, and obviously there is that idea that it's not just the importance of the team but also a sense of leadership and uh, being mm. looked after um, not just by your mates but also then by uh, your chain of command. And we, and we certainly see that uh, in, in things that people talk about what can be frustrating for them is when they don't have that nice strong sense of have, being part of a team or not feeling supported by leadership. We also often talk about people, not only do they transition into the military, they have to transition out of the military. Um, you spoke about some of the factors that can make that challenging for um, the individuals, but what do you think are some of the factors that can help someone to have a positive transition experience? Um, Phil, have you got any ideas about that? What are the things that make it positive for people? I think um, I think just the willingness to invest in their care, that's what they're looking for. And, and quite often, a lot of ex-serving personnel will, will go and see multiple practitioners to try and find one that they can connect with, someone who's willing to listen and, and understand their, their background, including their military background. And for, for all providers, all health providers out there who are listening, who are not from a defence background, it, it doesn't matter. You just need to be able to provide a willingness to, to show your care, okay? And you're willing to understand their background and, and their conditions, and and you're willing to, you know, enact some of the support to, to ensure that they they can get well. Yeah, fantastic. We, we do know that there are barriers to people seeking um, health care and and medic and mental health care. What, what do you think some of those stigmas and barriers are for people, even after they've transitioned out of military service? Um, John, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, look, there's, I mean, in terms of identity, and particularly if you've been medically discharged, you know, moving from something because you feel that you've been pushed out can be, you know, a big barrier because it makes people want to isolate. And, you know, when we think about transitioning, you know, taking a psychotherapeutic approach, Erickson had a lot of lovely stuff to say, particularly about separation and individuation. Now, he was talking about teenagers and young adults there, but it's a similar process that people go through when they leave the military because they're going, they have to actually separate from that family of origin, from that community, and create a new identity. And unfortunately, when they've got injuries or whatever else, that identity can be quite broken because they take on those injuries and they take on those reasons for being discharged as being a part of who they are and what they are because they're no longer fit for the original purpose. And so as clinicians, a big part of our job is actually helping people to move towards things rather than moving away from things. Mm -hmm. And so it can often come down to saying, you know, rather than what you can't do now, what can you do and what would you like to do? Because this is, you know, often a huge um, opportunity for people that we don't really see it that way. Because 
you know, when, when you leave defence, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do that are really well supported through DVA and through other organisations as well. And I think that's one of the biggest things to consider, just asking people, well, you know, would you like to study? What would you like to do? And then just helping them you know, try and come up with different things for themselves that they can start to move on with their lives. Yeah, that, and that, that's a great point that you're making, that uh, there are actually a great deal of services which are available for, uh, for people out there. Sometimes they don't know what they are. And in fact, sometimes clinicians aren't really sure what some of those services are. Um, and I should have mentioned before, there's a whole heap of resources which are available to you and ideas about um, where you can go for more information and the type of services which are available uh, for you as clinicians and also for veterans. But um, often that we, we find that there's other people in their lives which really can assist veterans in terms of going out to seek support and connect with others. Christy, who are the type of people or organisations that can support veterans? Yeah, there's quite a few organisations that are dedicated to supporting veterans. Obviously, the Department of Veterans Affairs provides um, a whole lot of um, support um, and Open Arms is the counselling service aligned within Department of Veterans Affairs and they provide individual counselling but also really good group programs for veterans and their families, which is really important. So families get access to all of those support services as well. There are also ex-service organisations which really um, focus on veterans and, and uh, focus on getting them connected within communities, which is really great as both Phil and John have mentioned that social participation and being in the community is really important. Um, it's already ready made for them while they're in service and when they transfer out, um, that's where we need to um, link them in. Clinical teams need to link them in with support services, but then also those support services in the community can actually create supportive environments for them. So ex-service organisations like Soldier On, um, Mates for Mates and RSL Defence Care um, really provide a lot of support to veterans. Yeah, that's great and, and that's really highlighting that role. It's important that we have a multidisciplinary team to support mm. people and that can also include not just clinicians but also some of these other ex-serving organisations and also mm. families have a really important role, don't they, in terms of encouraging people to get into care and to stay in care and often they're the ones that really encourage people in the first place to get there. Yeah. yeah, Nicole, I'd actually like to really strongly support the psychosocial rehabilitation mm -hmm. that ex-service organisations can provide too. And so like groups like the Road Home in Adelaide, for mm -hmm. example, that run a whole bunch of physical-based activities as well as sporting programs. And then you know, I'm running my groups through there as well too. And then Mates for Mates in Hobart, Brisbane and Townsville. So they provide some clinical services but a whole bunch of other activities as well. And I think one of the biggest things that veterans struggle with is that feeling of being alone. And mm -hmm. so, you know, utilising not just clinical resources, but the psychosocial rehabilitation um, support that you can get from these ex-service organisations is huge. It's, yeah, it's enormous. Yeah, that's fantastic and great, great point. Okay, Phil? I was just going to say, I really like John's comment earlier about, about avoiding social isolation. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're trying to get these 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 veterans engaged with social organisations, we need to enhance their, their network of support so that there are more people involved in their care and and that that can only lead to, to greater self-value, self-worth, you know, and they feel, they, they mm. sort of start to return to that self, um, that, that belonging to an organisation, which is really important. Mm. Just that sense of fit, yeah. This is somewhere I belong. This is a group of people I can relate to and understand, mm. and you know that just helps. Yeah, yeah. and it helps rebuild then, that um, sense of identity, as we've talked about. That's you know the military sense of self is so strong when you're currently serving that mm. sometimes that's really then hard to um, leave when you leave the, the service. And rebuilding that takes time, as we all know, having served and and um, transitioned ourselves, it takes time to actually build a sense of who you are outside of that. And those support uh, mechanisms can really help. Yeah, so that you know that's a really nice and important discussion around um, if you're a clinician, not working by yourself with the individual, individual, mm. but you look at building a multidisciplinary team, but also looking at what other organisations may be able to support, and really looking at the holistic needs of this individual, not just their mental health and their health, but their psychosocial needs as well, is a really critical part of that uh, assessment and and uh, that that theme of helping people not to be socially isolated is really important. Um, Christy, one of the things I was interested in about, um, if you do have someone who's coming to see you in clinical practice, 
How can you tentatively ask about their experiences, that exposure to life-threatening events? Yeah, it's a really important question and I, I think it is a bit individual. You need to get to you know your client a little bit and what works for them in terms of probing questions when um, you know it takes a while to sort of get to know your, your client a bit. Um, but it is important I think um, to, as you said, to know whether the, the client has actually served in the military and ask whether they are a veteran. But to just sort of ask them a bit about, you know, when you're on deployment, what did you actually do? What was a typical day for you? Um, you know, did you did you operate in a team? Did you, um, was your role, did your role involve you sort of working by yourself a bit? Did you have to move around the theatre, which gives you a bit of an idea of whether they travelled around in a vehicle or whether they might have had to fly around in a helicopter or whether they spent most of the time on the ship if they're in the Navy. Um, um, or you know, most of the time on a, on a base um, if they're in some other service. So it just really, just really try to get an understanding of what that person did on a day-to-day -day basis. Then that, that can then probe, um, help you probe other questions in terms of what they might have actually been exposed to in terms of in terms of that sense of danger. And also it gives you an indication of the sense of purpose that they got out of that sort of deployment experience and um, how then they might need to rebuild that sense of identity and that sense of purpose um, now that they're in the community. So it's, um, there's no hard and fast rule but it is really just um, you know, gentle probing questions to really uncover um, some of those um, stressors and exposures that people were under. As I said in my introduction, a lot of people deny, a lot of people who've been in service deny have ever been in a dangerous situation where um, mm. actually when you, when you peel away the layers from that, um, it is a potentially um, you know, dangerous situation and potentially mm. traumatic. It's just that it's not how it's actually perceived by a military veteran. Um, so and then th that that requires or can require some education then around what impact that might actually have um, in terms of their current mental health and well-being, how they relate to their family, why it is they feel that, like they want to be isolate themselves rather than actually connect in their community and those sorts of things, and why it is they're hyper vigilant a lot because they might be um, you know continuing to be um, quite fearful of of um, their environment based on their deployment experiences that haven't ex necessarily joined the dots. So yeah, it's just, it's a gradual process. Yeah, and also, and, and remembering that sometimes it's about the trauma that it's, uh, you know, difficult things that have happened as part of their everyday life that might have occurred exactly. um, before or during their military service, which isn't related to deployment and isn't yeah. even related to their military so service. True. Yeah. Yeah, Nicole, that's actually Sorry. really important to emphasize. Sorry, um, because like during you know normal military service, we're very very good at normalising the abnormal, and mm -hmm. you know this happens on a daily basis, on a regular basis, and you know we talk about deployments as being peak things. A lot of people don't deploy, but a lot of mm -hmm. people are injured physically and mentally through the conditions of their service. You know, through being in a really rigid hierarchical organisation that has a lot of authority and power over the individual, and. You know, being able to explore those sorts of issues is really important, and not just having someone go, "Oh, well, I saw a bit of shit," and you know, so what? Everyone did, you know, yeah. and actually being able to probe further and knowing that you know we are very good at putting things in a box and putting it away and just going, "Well, that mm. was normal. Everyone saw mm. it. Why am I, why am mm. I special?" You know, just asking those questions. Yeah, great point. Sorry, and so. I was just going to say, I think asking those questions is really valuable. It shows that you're interested in them mm. and you're, you're more inclined to get them to, to open up about their background. Sometimes that can be a bit hard. They're a little bit reluctant to talk about some of those situations or their work roles or whatever it was they did. Mm. And I often, I often, in those cases, I'll often start and say, what did you think about, you know, in your time in the, in the service? You know, did you, did, you, did you enjoy it? You know, did you get a lot from it? And that can sort of open up that... Um, a box to that information about them. And of course yeah, we know right. that, that their view about their service history is a, is a big factor for any, any uh, mental health mm -hmm. conditions. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think that uh, you know, in summary the really important thing is you need to ask about um, what was their, their service experience and what was the meaning of their service for them, mm -hmm. um, but then also what was the meaning of their transition, uh, what was their transition uh, experience and what were the conditions of that um, and then also what are their goals in terms of the forward thinking mm. idea that uh, many of you spoke about uh, for the future. Um, just as a quick final uh, point, what do you think some of the, when we're coming up with treatment 
goals for veterans? What are some of the considerations that we should be keeping in mind? And um, Phil, we might start with you on that. I think it's important that um, the, the veteran themselves understand that they are the, they're sort of centrally in command of their treatment. Okay, they're the ones that need to make decisions about the way forward. We need to ask them what they you know what they see as, as, the, as the outcome they want to achieve, and and ensure that any 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 management any clinical management we provide supports that. You know, um, in the military, the emphasis is on. Uh, forcing them to, to accept their health care, but out in the civilian world, they need to accept that responsibility. And we need to encourage that. We need to ask them, uh, we, need to, we need to gain their support you know, when we're pursuing uh, management or treatment options. Yep. Right. Uh, we've actually run out of time for general discussion. And so what we might do is I'm just going to go around the group and give you a, a chance to say your take home message. Uh, and uh, John, we'll start with you. Yeah, thanks. Look, I think I would just say, ask, you know, ask, ask your patients, what are their biggest problems? And if you could do one thing, what would that be? And then how could you help it? And so for me, a psychiatrist, obviously mental health issues are a big thing, but there's also a lot of substance abuse and there's a lot of chronic pain. And so ask so that you can work with other clinicians to help that person in the chair in front of you actually get back and become more functional and get on with their lives. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, John. And Phil, what would your take home messages be for everyone? I think we often talk about the veterans who are suffering, whether it's physically or mentally, you know, but we need to understand that all veterans, no matter how healthy or, or, or fun highly functioning they are, we all need to, you know, they all need support and they all need to know that they're okay. For those who have um, lost their identity, you know, in, in the transition process, they, they feel empty and it's important that we can sort of, you know, fill them with a sense of hope and motivation about their future. And we can do that with, with recruiting as many people, you know, within their clinical care, to, uh, sorry, to clear team to give them as much yeah, support. Yeah, fantastic. Don't be afraid to ask them. Don't, ask, don't be afraid to talk to them about what their needs are. Um, Christy, have we still got you there? I can't see you, but can we hear yeah. you? So I haven't I haven't left um, my my picture has but I haven't left um, yeah thanks Nicole just as a as a last final comment um, I think you know some of the echo the, some of the sentiments that have already been said that be curious and be respectful of veterans um, serving in the military does provide people with a unique sense of purpose associated with assisting people in need and it's often um, involves going overseas or travelling around Australia to help civilian community it creates an environment for shared experiences. And that um, shared sense of purpose is difficult to recreate outside the military, but as, we, as we've discussed, we need to find unique ways to be able to do that and for them to remain socially connected and um, working with their goals, not just necessarily what we want to, what we want to focus on in treatment for them, um, but um, working on the goals that the, the veteran wants to um, actually uh, has come to seek treatment for. And I think that's really important and enjoy working with them. It's, um, they're an interesting bunch of people. Yeah, great. Thank you. And, and thanks so much to everyone for sharing those uh, thoughts and your insights and then also your personal experiences. I think there's been a great discussion around uh, how you might talk to a veteran. Um, and I just as a final, my final point to people out there, um, we, we know that many of you who've joined us don't have experience with working with veterans or might do it very infrequently. Um, there is support for you there. Uh, and one of the things that is being provided uh, through the Centenary of Anzac Centre, which is initiation, uh, an initiative which sits under Phoenix Australia, is the Practitioner Support Service. Now, this is a free service uh, which can be accessed nationally. Um, and if you're seeing veterans and uh, you have any questions or you want some support or you want to talk about a particular case, you can call in, you can um, make contact through the website and get advice from a multidisciplinary panel and that includes Phil and Christy are also on that panel. Uh, we have a couple of psychiatrists, a social worker, a psychologist and uh, a GP um, and we can give you some uh, very quick advice about um, how do you look after that veteran and, and what's the type of uh, treatment uh, options that you have and what are the other services that you connect them in with. So that's uh, really a service I would be encouraging you to have a look at and to please be using, um, you don't need to be doing this by yourself. We know that uh, working with veterans can be extremely rewarding, but there's, there can also be challenges for people. 
So uh, that's the end of the, uh, the webinar and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. A uh, couple of final admin points. Uh, the whole point of MHPN is making sure that people are connected and that uh, special interest groups are being set up. So, uh, you know, if you have any particular areas of interest or you'd like to join in with the network or find uh, who in your area is also working in uh, areas that interest you, then please get onto their website and find out more. Um, there's more webinars which are occurring as part of this online conference and the next one uh, is the uh, activity which is next week, the Comorbid Mental Health Conditions in Veterans, Strategies for Assessment, Case form Formulation and Treatment which is on Tuesday the 4th of June. Um, there are the resources which are available which have been put together uh, by panel members but also resources which are suggested for people through Department of Veterans Affairs so make sure you have a look at those. Um, we'd also really encourage you to fill out the exit survey and to give us some feedback. Um, thanks so much uh, again to our panellists for joining us and uh, giving us their insights. A uh, really good discussion that we had this evening. Thanks everyone for joining us uh, on the webinar. Thanks to those people who are watching later on as part of the podcast. And uh, that's it for this evening and thanks everyone for joining us.